turbos. We all love them. They're the magical snail-shaped power adders that can turn even an average engine into a fire-breathing monster. But how do these bad boys actually work? And what exactly are the pros and cons of going turbo? Today on Autolab, we're gonna find out. Turbos aren't actually really all that complicated, and they've been around for over a hundred years. Back in the day, this guy had a genius idea. He realized that you could use an engine's exhaust gases to drive a compressor, which would then shove more oxygen-packed air into the cylinders, making them even more explosive. They were first used on diesel engines in the marine industry, and then started getting used a lot more on aircraft engines around World War I, so that fighter planes maintained sea level performance at an altitude where the air is thinner, aka turbo normalizing. When a turbo is used to exceed ambient sea level pressure figures, that's called turbo charging. Automakers started playing with turbos back in the 50s, and we got the first production turbocharged car in 1962. <laughs> And it didn't take long for the hot rodders and tuners of the day to get their hands on them either. But before we dive into how this spoolie boy works, we gotta break down the basics of an engine. Picture an engine as a massive air mover, or pump. It sucks air and fuel into a cylinder, then compresses and combusts it before blowing it out. Also known as suck, squeeze, bang, blow. At its core, getting more power out of an engine means burning more fuel which makes the explosions in the cylinders bigger and better. But here's the catch. Without enough air, that extra fuel is about as useful as Brad with a wrench. <sighs> Adding more fuel is easy, but how the heck do you get more air? See, an engine is limited by how much air it can move, AKA its displacement. One way to pump more air is to build an engine that has larger cylinders. The problem with that, though, is big engines are heavier, typically slower to rev, and about as nimble as a sumo wrestler. But there's no replacement for displacement, am I right? Wrong! A turbo makes a small engine flow more air, making it capable of making the same power as a much bigger one. So you can think of a turbo kind of like an on-demand displacement modifier. So here's your turbo. Looks like wow. a snail, but don't let that fool you. In fact, this baby is capable of spinning in excess of over 100,000 RPM. Exhaust gases from your engine enter here and spin this turbine wheel before getting shot out your tailpipe. The turbine is connected to a compressor wheel on the other side. And as it spins, it sucks in fresh air, crams it down your engine's throat, and voila, more power. But not so fast, because all that exhaust and moving air means turbochargers get really hot. The turbine side, which we affectionately call the hot side, more often than not looks rusty because it's basically operating like a mini blast furnace. The extreme heat acts like a catalyst and causes the metal to oxidize more quickly. And the cold side isn't actually really all that cold. When air is compressed, molecules are forced closer together, which causes a bunch of friction. All that friction makes the air coming out of the turbo hotter than a hot pocket in an easy bake oven. Oh. Huh. No. The thing is, hot air isn't dense, and dense air is what we want. That's where intercoolers come in. An intercooler is like a radiator for your turbocharged air. It sits between your turbo and your engine and forces the air to pass through channels with cooling fins. Cooler outside air passes over those fins, extracts the heat, and cools that compressed air right back down, packing those molecules closer together and feeding your engine the dense, oxygen-rich air it craves. Oh, and that hole in your hood isn't just for catching birds. It keeps your intercooler cool too. But what keeps a turbo from just spinning itself into oblivion? That, my friends, is where the wastegate comes in. It allows exhaust gases to bypass the turbo to regulate its speed and boost pressure. When maximum boost pressure is reached, or when you let off the throttle, the wastegate opens up and allows all that exhaust to just cruise on by. But that's not the only thing that controls boost pressure. The wastegate can't do anything about the already pressurized air in your intake system. <laughs> When you jump off the throttle, well, all that pressurized air has to go somewhere, and ideally, we don't want it slamming back into installing the turbocharger. And that, folks, is the job of the blow-off valve. <laughs> off throttle, or when over boost, the blow-off valve opens up and vents all that pressurized air back into the atmosphere. 
Some designs use a diverter valve, which keeps all the air in the system so your car's engine computer doesn't have to do complicated math to keep your engine running right. We'll make another Autolab video explaining mass airflow sensors and engine controls, but we're getting off track. So in theory, if a turbocharger flows air and more air leads to more power, a bigger turbo should need bigger power, right? Fortunately, it's not that simple. Ever heard of turbo lag? It's the awkward pause between stomping on the gas and actually feeling the boost. It's like waiting for your internet to buffer right before the good part of a video. Bigger turbos flow more air, but they also take longer to get up to speed. And on something like a small four-cylinder that doesn't flow a lot of exhaust gas on its own, a bigger turbo isn't always the answer. Engineers tried to solve this with twin turbos. T twins, Basil, twins. But they didn't stop there. There are parallel turbos, sequential turbos, two-stage turbos, compound turbos, variable geometry turbos, and now there are even turbochargers that are electrically assisted. Now, real quick, if you guys love turbos as much as we love turbos, well, check out these limited edition turbo tees. We got the ice cream drip turbo tee and the don't die turbo tee. Check them out before they're gone. Links up here or down in the first description. Now, let's learn about the different types of turbos. When it comes to using more than just one turbo, parallel turbos are the simplest. One turbo per cylinder bank. And to keep both banks balanced, you either have the turbochargers power their opposite banks, or you combine the charge air together as it enters the engine. Early twin turbo cars like the Maserati Bi-Turbo, Nissan 300Z, and Mitsubishi 3000 GT all used a parallel turbo system. But sequential, or two-stage turbos, are where things get spicy. With this design, a smaller turbo spools up quickly for instant power, then hands things off to a larger turbo for that sweet, sustained boost at high RPMs. The 80s and 90s were the golden era of turbos like this. Back then, turbocharged cars were like rock stars, temperamental, loud, always on edge. Think cars like Audis and Group B Racing. <laughs> Street cars like the Mark IV Supra and FDRX7. Compound turbos are the same, with one small turbo and one bigger one, but the difference is the exhaust gases flow through them in series. The little turbo's only job is to help get the big turbo spinning. This configuration is most commonly found on big diesel engines. We've all seen the videos of big compound setups. Then of course, there are variable geometry or variable vane turbos, which can modify the flow of exhaust gases hitting the turbine wheel. At lower engine speeds, the vanes move to a narrower angle, which increases velocity and spins the turbo up faster to reduce lag. And at higher RPMs, those vanes can open up and allow more exhaust flow, which optimizes top end power. These were first seen on cars like the Fiat Proma and Lancia Delta Integrale and 993-911 Turbo. And now, with cars like the 911 GTS, we even have electric turbos. And I'm not talking about one of those 12 volt snake oil turbos you get on Timu or wherever the cool kids shop these days, but a real 400 volt electrically assisted turbo that can be spooled instantaneously, essentially eliminating turbo lag. It can also be used as an energy recovery unit, and if you want to learn more about it, then go watch this video right up here. Turbochargers used to be reserved for race cars and the hottest, most performance oriented cars on the road, but now turbos are everywhere from your mom's grocery getter to your dad's pickup, and of course, some of our favorite supercars. And they're not just used for performance anymore, but also to boost efficiency. The pros seem pretty obvious. There are a few cons though. Extra weight, more complexity, more stress on the engine, and more heat under the hood to name a few. With that said though, these days, turbocharged cars are extremely reliable, and it's estimated that of all combustion-powered cars sold this year, roughly 40% of them are turbocharged. And there are plenty of turboed cars in production right now that aren't exactly thrilling to drive. But for a lot of them, you're only a cell phone, a few hundred bucks, and a quick remap away from letting that inner turbo power shine. So go out there and reflash your mom's Volvo. Just don't tell her I told you so. If you enjoyed learning about turbos, hit that subscribe button and give us a like. We've got more videos on everything from engines to exhaust to tuning and suspension and maybe even some stuff your mechanic doesn't want you to know. If you want to learn about the difference between a turbocharger and a supercharger, well, click this video here. Or go watch Brad run through some of the best cheap cars that have insane tuning potential right here. My name's Trav. Thanks for hanging with me today on Autolab. See you all with a fresh video next week.